My next guest is a legend in e-commerce and was recognized as one of Canada's 40 under 40 by Bloomberg. Hassan Halazon left Amman, Jordan to study at McGill 20 years ago and spent the better part of those two decades on the cutting edge of Canada's e-commerce landscape. His company, Emerge Commerce, just recently IPO'd on the Toronto Stock Exchange and is growing its portfolio of niche online shopping brands, which they acquire and manage. It's a solid business model that's worked for titans like Warren Buffett in the offline world. And I'm excited to see where Ghassan is going to take it from here. I caught up with Ghassan on his recent trip to Jordan and we chatted about Emerge and the e-commerce landscape. And in the end, some tips on how to stay on top of things mentally. Enjoy. Dude, man, I'm so glad you came. Yeah, man, we caught you at the tail end of your Christmas New Year's trip with the family. Well, did you do some Middle East business on that? Not really. It's it's all family. By the sun is and il marata. I got it. Really, my first vacation in you know, a, a real one with the family. And when bastalle yeah. hunak, you don't really get to move in a year like this. It was a total and focused fam trip and uh, quality time uh, so how many pounds did you gain the last two weeks? <laughs> you know <laughs> but at least we say now it's uh we have an ipo under our belt i know right? man congratulations <laughs> yeah. dude yeah, yeah. talking to a ceo of a public company Mabru. congrats buddy it's amazing thank you thank you uh, so that's really incredible news and uh well, by the way and since i yeah. told you I'm, i'll edit a lot of stuff and i do the big intros later on to keep it casual and also, we don't know where this is going to head. So <laughs> yeah, we really don't. <laughs> we really don't. I've never, I've never done a podcast where I have face no clue face. where oh, this is. this is like totally <laughs> hecky wild. Yeah, yeah, this is wild, By wild way, west in the Middle East. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> ف... بس إحنا يعني, we've shared, uh, we grew up in West Amman. That's right. <laughs> 80s and 90s. And some of my earliest memories of you, we were four years apart in high school. But before high school, I have a memory of you. Uh, Let me guess, raising money. <laughs> Before that, <laughs> yeah. uh, we were in Aqaba, which is like the sleepy Red Sea town in Jordan, yeah. uh, beach town. We we're playing football with a group of kids, and you were with us for some reason. And I was like, oh, whatever, okay, this kid. And you did a number on a couple of guys with the with the soccer, obviously not American football. And I was like, holy shit, this kid, this scrappy kid, is like is going between all these older guys. I'm like, fuck, this kid, he's witty with the ball. So I don't know if you play football anymore or soccer. Well, first of all, I just want to put it out there that <laughs> I don't remember that story. So I was uh, enjoying hearing it and seeing where it was going to go. Uh, no, not really. I, I uh, As you can see, uh, <laughs> it's not the case anymore. I had a knee injury, an ACL injury, and I act like it happened yesterday, but it really happened in 2000. I was playing on the soccer team of our school, and I think I honestly gradually slowed down from then on. Uh, By the way, you were probably like 10 years old in this story. So I'm, talking, I'm not talking <laughs> yeah, yeah. high school, I'm talking about like yeah, yeah, early, nine, early days. Yeah, yeah. Nine, 10 you know, years the old. potential was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as yeah, with really most things. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, man. So that's my earliest memory of you. And honestly, we never crossed paths, maybe because we were four years apart. And then I remember the next thing I hear, I think it was the Groupon bubble 20 years later. Yeah. And I remember you were like, I was reading something and you were straddling that freaking tech bubble by the horns i think yeah. it was team buy yep it was your first big venture my yeah. god man so you've been in the e-commerce for a while now that's right that was the time where i quit and left everything i had in new york and moved to toronto to start what at the time was pretty much as you pointed out the groupon of of canada yeah i had done my undergrad at mcgill and knew the canadian landscape quite well uh, so it was a natural market to kind of go there and we started off and within two three years we had couple of hundred employees across the country. We had raised venture capital. We we were kids. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. It was 25, 26 years old. And we were just told to go as fast as we possibly could. And then we found ourselves in a position where a lot of what you call a startup degree and all the learnings that come with it and all the mistakes that come with it, uh, we made a ton of those. And of course, we poured a lot of that into where we are today. I feel like with uh, Emerge Commerce, this is your current yeah. A huge venture and hearing you talk about it over the last two years, especially now with the IPO recently, that it's such a mature business model. It's such a mature approach mm. compared to the scale or die 
kind of hype. It's post-hype e-commerce, post-hype approach, which is, for me, it's something I'm willing to bet on. Because I've been in retail for now a couple of years. Mm -hmm. We're dabbling in e-commerce since COVID in a serious way now. Obviously, we have to. Any retailer should be. But yeah, it sounds amazing. I mean, tell us more about what you guys have been doing. In many ways, Emerge is a second coming of sorts. It's sort of us pouring our learnings from our previous venture into what is, as you pointed out, a a more sustainable way to scale, a a disciplined sort of capital allocation strategy at the end of the day, right? So in e-commerce, as with many different tech companies, you tend to hear that companies are loss-making through the nose. Even some that reach the highest levels, you know, when Uber went public, when really any other glitzy startup made it to the public domain, it always was accompanied by headlines that said, you know, exorbitant losses, will they ever become profitable? And in the Amazon cases of the world, and there aren't many, they don't really need to be profitable because yeah. if they're growing like crazy, if they've amassed billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars worth of scale, they can always afford to reinvest and raise capital at very uh, cheap cost. The problem becomes in the middle and in the smaller game, right? Small to medium-sized technology and e-commerce companies that never see the light of day end up finding themselves in a compromising position, which is to say that they can't graduate to the big leagues. And all of a sudden, if you're not making money, you're at the mercy of the venture capital community or the VCs. If you take capital from uh, the big VCs, then at some point, they expect a return, whether that's four, five, seven years out. Uh, and if they don't see you being that next, forget up, forget a billion dollar company these days. If they don't see you being a ten billion dollar company or even a hundred billion dollar company, um, then you're in trouble. Yeah. And so emerge in many ways was like, well, maybe there's a smarter way to do this. Like maybe we don't have to just follow this playbook just because everybody else is. And so we said, what if we went out and found not these loss-making companies that were built on uh, scale or die or growth at all costs, but what if we could go and find these like cool little hidden bootstrap companies that are founder-owned and operated, uh, that are blood, sweat, and tears, um, that are making money today, right? That have proven over a couple of years that, hey, me, my team, my brand, we're doing it. You know, we're doing it without anyone's help. And yes, we're not going to a billion dollars, but we're making money and we're growing steadily and we have everything under control. And what if Emerge could play this consolidator role Mm. where we would pick these businesses up, we would have the founders join, we would maintain the brands and we would help them all join forces under a much bigger ecosystem where they share technology, resources, data, management, capital raising, and of course, acquisitions and so forth, right? So that's sort of the thesis um, of Emerge. And actually Emerge, some people don't connect the dots, which is a little disappointing, but Emerge stands for E-Merge, merging e-commerce companies. Okay. No, no, it's it's obviously also a pun. A pun on. We're both. Yeah, it's amazing. And also your ticker is, uh, what is it? E-Com? E-Com, which stands for e-commerce. Yeah. Which is a little daring yeah. to, to put. I mean, that, it's like okay, put, put the name of the, damn. And, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, like, we were surprised that it was, it was available. available. <laughs> and uh, and then someone said, "Well, not everybody's that audacious, right? You know, like it's not like shopping just, for a domain not, name and finding like the four-letter words. Like, damn. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but listen, I want to get into the synergy. Yeah, asking yeah. you about the amazing synergies that you guys are creating, which is like not almost like a technology management play. Yeah. But before that, I want to ask you about when you guys picking yeah. out like these amazing, uh, like you said, middle of the road. Yes successful uh, e-commerce uh, companies. What is kind of the, the difference between, when you're looking at uh, across the board, between an e-commerce company that has almost burnt out with the VC track mm-hmm. that's become yeah. unsexy over a few years yeah. versus one that's founder-owned yeah. company? Is it the EBITDA, basically? Is it that this one is more EBITDA, healthier? What, what's the difference between those two tracks? Yeah. Totally. I mean, when you boil it down to the financials, we're talking profitability. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's much bigger than that because profitability in the end is a sort of a summation of a lot of different things that go into the formula. It's literally the bottom line, right? And so it's the last in order. I think what happens at the top, mainly from a cost perspective and from a revenue growth perspective is the difference. So the venture capital crowd, their model is built on home runs. What that means is they're looking for that gem, that one out of 10, or even in some cases, one or two out of 100. 
that really blow it out of the park, right? So for them, um, and I don't mean to call it a game, it's their business model after all, but there isn't exactly that alignment with any given founder. The founder, their, their whole life is into this one startup. It's everything to them. They want to take their time with it. They want to get it right. They want to make the right long-term decisions. They don't want to just pump money in and grow, grow, grow. And to that extent, there is misalignment from day one, the minute a venture capital a group comes in. And so that's one issue. But beyond that, typically venture capital folks tend to, and many of them are our friends, by the way, we just agree to disagree, they tend to invest in relatively complex structures. So when they put capital into the company, they come in and demand, you know, preferential treatment or pref shares or, you know, there are many ways you can structure things. But what that ends up meaning for founders is when you typically hear of a $100 million exit, somebody sold their company for $100 million. It's not the case that the founders, if it's VC backed at least, it's not the case that the founders made, you know, $50 million or $80 million. It's typically the case that they've made more like 5 to 10% of the overall pie. Uh, which is still a lot of money for a lot of people. But it becomes trickier for founders to achieve incredible returns, except if they reach the moon, which is also very rare, right? Versus with a bootstrap company that's never raised capital or raised capital from angels and kept things tight and focused on profitability. When someone like Emerge comes along and we purchase the business for a multiple of EBITDA or a multiple of profit, it's grounded in reality it's quantifiable, it's super clear, but the best part for the founder is typically we find they own anywhere between 50 to 80% of the business because they've never really diluted themselves. And so all of a sudden a founder, you know, for a $15 million exit means the founder might walk away with $10 million, which is way, way more, he controls his destiny, there's no board conflicts, there's no drama, and yet they come in and join us. They, so they get a very meaningful cash out but then they also get currency in Emerge, shares in Emerge. And so in our case, you know, uh, since we IPO, the stock is up about 55%. I know it's still early days, but it's really awesome to be able to share with other founders and even staff members. Every single member on our team has options and shares in the company. And so for them to see that growth in value live, there's no real replacement for that type of incentive. That's amazing, actually, that everybody has uh, this kind of incentive built in. It's big in. It's uh, such a great structure to have in place. I, I want to tie it back to the Middle East because this is something I hear about and, and talk about a bit. It seems for whatever reason, and again, this whole concept of incentivizing staff and giving options to everyone mm -hmm. is a very Silicon Valley-based model. So we got to give them credit. Not everything they do is evil. And this sort of utopian way of everyone going up together. And I think they do a very good job of that. Granted, there are some horror stories out there. But you, you got to look at that piece and somehow think about why or how it can be incorporated more in the Middle East. Listen, the benefits are amazing when you do that. I think in the Middle East, it's the divorce side. Yeah. The messy divorce is that what keeps people away from from like the union of any kind of mm -hmm. like equity side. That's what most family businesses are facing here when when they think of employee shares and, yeah. and even like more equity sharing in general. It gets messy. I hope that with, you know, success stories like Kareem, because I understood there was a fair amount of folks on board that had some sort of equity in the company and now all of a sudden that's trickling into the ecosystem. I hope that that sort of mentality starts taking more shape with especially with seeing that level of success. But definitely I think I've heard a lot of people surprised that every single person in the company has shares when I come back here and talk about it. And I don't understand why. Like carving out 5 or 10% of your company for the people who literally drive the ship forward every single day um, is is mind blowing to to, to want to stand in the way. But of. let me ask you: Was that the case before it went public? No. Yes. Oh, it was. Yes. That's so, maybe what's surprising because when you go public and you give options, it yes. kind of makes sense it's as part of their compensation package yes. to give options with their with their salary and stuff. So we, even privately. It, it, privately. So so and we had this was tricky for us because we had to. St I mean, our business is to keep acquiring new companies. So how do you build that plan? that can cater to new, you know, you know, 20, 30, 50 people coming in at a time every three, four, six months. Um, so we had to kind of build it creatively, but at the end of the day, yeah, everyone who came into the company has a piece of the company. Wow, amazing.
I want to jump back into the actual business model. So you guys acquire these e-commerce businesses that are relatively successful. They're not ideally run. Uh, what are the things that you sort of clean up or synergize when once you take them on board? And what do you guys discuss with them when you want to onboard them? I'm so interested in this concept because you're creating so much value and cutting out so much fat that they're straddled with as a single market uh, player. Yeah. Um, and I want to clarify, like when we acquire these businesses, typically we like to think of them as they've and, and we're betting on like horses right at the end of the day. That's kind of what we're doing. Like we're betting on companies that are, in fact, quite well run and market leaders in their respective niche or category. But where we come in is kind of like helping them think through scale. Because I always say going from zero to say 10 or $20 million a year in sales is very, very different than going from 10 or 20 to $100 million in sales, right? So that next level of growth where you need systems, you need data, you need architecture um, across the board is something that requires expertise and resources, right? So a lot of these bootstrap companies, and when I say bootstrap, again, it's sort of scrappy founders, not a lot of capital raised, if at all. Um, and so these companies, when they join Emerge, they tend to want to utilize our resources, our HQ team, uh, our data hub, and our cross-selling opportunities across the portfolio. So a, a simple way to think of it is we're sort of like a virtual mall operator. It's like us buying different virtual malls albeit each mall is a niche of some sort. One is for groceries, one is for you know playing golf and experiences, uh, right? So each mall has sort of a flavor, but in the end, they all get to share all the, as an example, in the offline world, you know, all the POS systems, all the security companies, that uh, the security company that do deals with everything, the cleaning company that does everything, uh, you know, the technology that drives inventory. So there's no need for each mall to invest in each of these things. And so that's exactly what we do, but for e-commerce, right? So we'll kind of basically consolidate email sending costs, fraud prevention, customer service, hosting, and then of course, management team. So things like, we'll keep the founding team and we'll partner with them from a multi-year run, but we'll come in and provide guidance on capital allocation, or if, if there are M&A opportunities or acquisition opportunities within each sector, they might not be experienced at how to acquire a company or what to price it at or how to integrate it. So that's kind of where we come in. These are all these different areas that we bring to the mix. But then there's also the cross-selling, which is we have 2 million members, different members, different segments, different income brackets and interests, uh, but that data becomes richer over time. And so whether it's to cross-sell, say, a mom gifting uh, a dad on Father's Day a special golf voucher, or whether it's um, a father gifting a kid or a mom, whether it's a, a spa package or a trampoline experience, you know, these are all possibilities across the portfolio. But then it's also for advertisers, you know, groups like Amex and McDonald's and Chrysler. And these are all sort of recurring advertisers of ours. So they're tapping into our network to mm -hmm. access really an intent-based audience, a group of people that are saying, raising their hand and saying, I want to see an ad uh, for a special offer that you don't give anywhere else. And that's what our network does. Amazing. So you have your team of ad campaign managers, whether it's across social media platforms yes. or Google uh, display networks or video, whatever. They're aware of your audience, your members, but not necessarily does the user yeah. of, let's say, one of your grocery platforms, uh, e-commerce pages, uh, they're not aware that another website, yeah. another business that's run separately, but that's under your big umbrella, that they're sister companies now. Yeah. To a certain extent, we share that we have sister sites that you can get some special offers on. Over time, there'll be a loyalty program, okay. uh, much like any other major sort of chain or conglomerate, mm. right? Where you can gain, you know, special points across the network. But this is still a bit early. We have five brands today. You know, when we have 20, mm. 30, 40, 50 brands, I think people start feeling like there's enough yeah. juice there. To create even like maybe like an endorser brand, like buy Emerge? Or totally. We, in many ways, sort of shied away from using the name Emerge and splashing it across all the brands. Each brand is a consumer brand that uh, audiences, for whatever reason, resonate with and have joined and stuck around with. So it's not our job to say an Emerge brand this or yeah, yeah. slap our logo everywhere. But it's really more an investor. In True, it's a, it's a double-edged sword yes. anyway to have yeah. an endorser brand because yes. then you have one brand could hurt the another brand and it's it's kind of messy. Like restaurants yeah. uh, and yes. hotels fall into that trap yes. where they have a like an endorser brand, like this hotel yes. by this group. <laughs> yeah, and then, you that's know, a bit of an of ego like, thing if yeah. you ask me. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Are you, what differentiates you, by the way, from like a private equity uh, firm that comes in and also maybe overlaps with some kind of the work you guys do with different companies? Yeah, good question. Uh, Two things, I think, come to mind right away. I think the first thing, we're quite similar in some ways, in that we both take a disciplined approach to capital allocation and operations, right? So that's what PE does, uh, or private equity. So in that way, we're similar. Uh, I think where we're different is, number one, they tend to have a horizon to, as you know, put you know their efforts into it, but ultimately flip it or sell it or take it public. Uh, with Emerge, we're buy and hold, right? So we're not here to necessarily just reap out a bit of value or juice it a bit and then flip it at a higher multiple, say three, four, five years down the line, as is typical with PE. So we're here to kind of amass this portfolio of very sticky, steadily growing, profitable cash flowing e-commerce companies. And in a way, we aspire, and I I don't make the comparison, Uh, sometimes people like to slap big names and say Uber of this or or Amazon of that. But in a way, if if I had to choose and say what we aspire to be and what our ambition is to look like down the line, I would choose to say that we're sort of eyeing a Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company or conglomerate of e-commerce. That's what we want to look like. We want to look like this amazing portfolio of tens or even hundreds uh, of e-commerce properties that all operate with their own management. Uh, They share resources when they can and when it makes sense. But we don't really, the other thing I was going to clarify, and this really ties into the mantra here, we're not all about just cutting cost. We don't just buy companies to slash them. In fact, that would be crazy because what we're buying is already working. So we're not here to mess them up. We're keeping the brand. We're keeping the founders. We sometimes even keep the offices, even if we have extra space, because we don't want to mess with the vibe. Like these guys, they figured it out. They're doing it really well. They're really smart. Like they're they're growing. They're profitable. They don't need to sell. They're number one normally in their category. You know, we just bought uh, a company called True Local yesterday. That's right. I that's saw right. that at midnight. I was checking it out. I was like, congratulations. That's right. That's that's, like... it's, it's the market leader in, in meat subscription, that's premium amazing. meat subscription. So they connect local farmers and suppliers with consumers looking to shop on meat. It's a monthly recurring membership model. So in uh, every month, the members get a box with the different meats that they pick. Uh, and it comes every time at the same time of the month. And that's an example of, you know, True Local is, um, you know, the number one player in Canada. It has a fast-growing presence in the U.S. Yep, that's exactly. incredible. That's, exactly. what I was, that's what was my next question about the U.S. market. So True Local uh, was announced yesterday. So obviously now you're a public company. Everything's, uh, everything's transparent. How much was it for? No hiding, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it, I think it was $16, $16 million? Yeah, so... so I mean, the, the headline purchase price was $16.8 million. Okay. Obviously, yeah. a lot goes into that between the upfront cash, yeah. the shares, and also the performance side. I think okay. that's an example of how we structure things. A meaningful portion of the consideration, more than half uh, in some cases, is in the ability of the founders and the team to continue to execute through the years. So it's not like they just sell and they leave. Mm-hmm. They're here. And of course, by the way, it's a self-fulfilling mechanism because if the next two or three years the team delivers over there, not only do they get more cash, but that tends to improve our share price at Emerge, at Ecom, and they gain from that as well because they have shares in, in Emerge as well. Yeah, right? amazing. Listen, I'm seeing a trend, yeah. which is great, that exists outside of the Amazon world. Amazon, of course, does have recurring grocery options yeah. for yes. many years now. But when you have something like that kind of high-quality mm-hmm. meat, you have the uh, the experiences, like mm. you guys have the, the nearby staycation stuff, yes. the leaders in the golf yeah. equipment and stuff like that. Those are things, as a Amazon shopper myself, there are things that don't exist on Amazon for some strange market reasons. For example, you cannot buy a high-quality bicycle uh-huh. on Amazon. Uh-huh. All the big names are, do yeah. not list on Amazon yeah. for some strange reason. I mean, Bezos is yes. coming for those guys. You'll, you'll <laughs> yeah. find their graves somewhere. He's coming in- for us all. Yeah. <laughs> but there are things that don't list on Amazon and, yeah. and will never be on Amazon yeah. for the foreseeable, yeah. I don't know how many years. And you guys are picking out, whether it's by default or by intention, the pipeline is so massive, man. Mm-hmm. It's so big. And yes. how many trillions uh, in North America of, of e-commerce sales in 2020? Yeah, happened? Like I mean, we're it's, talking four. I think there's four trillion dollars in yeah. e-commerce. There's still 20 to 25 trillion dollars in retail still offline. And what that means is, you know, if today the U.S. is at 
15% penetration. And the Middle East is probably where 2, 3, 4%, somewhere there. And growing fast, by the way. Uh, but if you extrapolate out and you look at places like China and South Korea, e-commerce penetration as a percentage of retail is closer to 20, 25%. And you know, anyone in the industry who knows quite a bit about this uh, knows that you know over the next five or maybe even 10 years, you're looking at anywhere between 30 to 50% of retail will be in e-commerce. And that's anyone's guess, frankly. No one exactly knows where. You know, 30 to 50% is trillions and trillions of dollars coming online. Um, so this isn't a winner-take-all category. Amazon, in all of its might, is still only 50% of the US. I'm not saying only as in the, it's a massive, massive company. But that also means that there's an, <laughs> there's another trillion dollars today out there that's div- divided up by all yeah. sorts of yeah, people. Yeah. So the notion that we'll have tens, even hundreds of multi-billion dollar e-commerce companies globally is definitely not far-fetched. In fact, we're already starting to see it. Yeah. How's your pipeline looking in terms of not just Canada, but also the U.S.? Mm. Is the U.S. hunting ground for you guys, or is it mainly Canadian established businesses that also sell a little bit to the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've happened to start in Canada. That's where we're based in, in Toronto. And the companies that we've acquired mostly have been around the Ontario region. Although True Local is out of Kitchener, also an Ontario company, but I don't know if you've heard of Waterloo, and it's a very big tech hub there. That's where BlackBerry was founded. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Shopify is out of Ottawa now. That's yeah. a mega force in e-commerce, oh, yeah. and that's more on the B2B side. But major success story, oh, yeah. as you can imagine. It's Canada's most valuable company. It's, it surpassed the Royal Bank of Canada oh, yeah. uh, last year. So there is a lot there that starts, and it's a natural starting point for us, because there's also a synergy when you're closer, uh, although no one comes to the office anymore. But like we can share merchant relationships, technology vendors. Mer- you know, There's a lot mm-hmm. of unspoken synergies by just being around each other in the same country, mm-hmm. uh, very much so in the, in the same region. To date, a couple of our companies do have a U.S. presence, like True Local is growing there. Underpar, our market leader in golf experiences and products, has majority of the revenues are out of the U.S. actually. Oh, okay. So California, Florida, Texas, a lot of the big golf states, we do very well there and we're growing rapidly. But in terms of pipeline, definitely we see as a, just a function of the sheer size of the market, more and more will be coming from the U.S. And frankly, I wouldn't rule out starting to look at international eventually. I just don't think we're going to delve there for the sake of it because there's so much synergy. Um, even if you look at Canada, which has tremendous internet penetration, over 30 million out of the 35 or 36 million population is online. And so we think there's still a lot of room to go in Canada, but certainly a lot more coming in the U.S. Yeah. And the reason I asked you about Canada-U.S. cross-border, I was actually thinking about it from a cross-border perspective Mm -hmm. uh, because my background is mainly in physical goods. Being based in Jordan is a nightmare in a sense because Jordan is not a part of any kind of open market. And the Middle East in general Mm -hmm. suffers from, there's five countries in the Gulf Mm -hmm. that have a relatively open market. Uh, You have markets like Egypt and Jordan that that have uh, the gatekeeper, the customs agents, which are business prevention agents, basically. And other countries in the West side, on, on the Western Arabian countries also have the same issues. And then there's like... You know, a quarter of our countries are like verging on failed state status, which is another issue. So for e-commerce to flourish in the Middle East, you have those five GCC countries, which are the, the sweet spot. Yeah. But then there's another massive challenge, which we deal with. Yes. It's a funny thing. And I don't know if Canadians, I mean, you said internet, Canada has like huge penetration, obviously most yeah. the U.S. as well. In Jordan, some of the biggest players online are companies that obviously used to be retail and are still probably retail but they don't really they don't necessarily have to have any more brick and mortar yes. storefronts are these facebook pages that have sure. 200 300,000 followers yes and they have probably like 5,000 photos on, on their yes. on their album and each photo is a product yes i personally shop from this sporting goods store now that's scrappy okay that's what i'm talking oh, about oh yeah listen <laughs> there's a sporting goods store they literally have 6,000 photos. Like and a catalog, basically. Catalog yeah. with prices. And the main way you buy, and that's how I do it, screenshot. Uh, wow. You then send it to the WhatsApp number of the company. The person, yeah. And this lady, she's like, okay, uh, send me your location. 
and this guy drives over and makes it happen later in the day and he just there's no credit card there's no such thing i know he doesn't even have a credit card machine like with him that's there's nothing there's but nothing. kudos to to them and making guys, it happen with and, but, and like, without resources oh my god so many people use those guys and yeah they have everything and their prices are dirt cheap they actually used to sell during yeah. lockdown like they would yeah. break curfew and they would come like during the lockdown i bought trampolines wow. i brought like crazy stuff for the kids they i was like Man, these guys are amazing. I can't even go to work, and these yeah. guys are delivering in the, <laughs> under the no, table. No, I mean, I mean, so. there's something to say about. It's true. I mean, over time, things uh, will will hopefully evolve, and and people get more more resources. But I do think there's something to say about that spirit and that scrappiness. Um, and maybe this isn't exactly where you wanted to to take it, but it's something I wanted to touch on today too, which is. As a someone who doesn't live here anymore, although I visit, I try to visit at least twice, if not three times a year. But I always make it a point to speak to people, especially sort of younger generations, not necessarily just in technology or in the startup space, but just to kind of get a, a, a glimpse of the feeling uh, on the ground, if you will, right? And it's something I've been seeing more and more of is like there's this general hunger and scrappiness that exists. And it's a bit surprising, I must say. I mean, you wouldn't expect, we're always so pessimistic around here. Even when I come, the minute I land in Jordan, I become pessimistic just because of, just, I, I feel like there's something in the air where we're always just almost humorously uh, negative about what what's possible or and whatnot. And, and, I, and I think it feeds off each other and it ends up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it's not really the truth or the core of who we are. And when you spend time, uh, I was in the Dead Sea, for example, yesterday uh, i called the hotel they said the pools are closed you can come but there's absolutely nobody and i said perfect i'm coming (laughs) and so i was literally there all by myself my parents were with me and we had this surreal (laughs) serene moment where there's literally like this entire resort you know how the resorts are in the dead sea and we were all to ourselves and i went down to the beach and i did the mud thing i was literally like this i imagine this is what an emperor would have lived like, you know, 500 years ago when you see some of these absolutely massive mansions where they live on their own. And so I went down to the beach, I put the mud on and I did that whole thing like a total tourist. And on my way back, it was a bit of a climb back up. So so there was a, a little trolley with a, with a guy who said, hey, I can, I can take you up. And so I was sitting in the back, we were both masked. And I asked him, I said, how long have you been here? And he says, three years. And he says, but you know what? Uh, this is just a transitionary job. I'm I'm actually from Jordan. I studied engineering, and I'm about to get back to my plan. But you know, this thing came in the way, and I thought, you know what? It's a good chance to meet and learn from people who you know have been successful, and and learn from the hotel. And it's a world class hotel, etc. And I just couldn't help but think to myself, that's awesome. Like you have people that are not ashamed to do what they got to do to go where they got to go. Right, and I think there's more and more of that in the youth and in young people around you. If you give them the chance, there's real hunger, there's real grit, and I think that's going to lead to great things down the line. If we give them a chance, and that's a big if. No, it's true. Yeah, there is, there is the scrappiness is here, the will to survive. You know, human resilience is everywhere. I mean, Jordan, obviously, you know, <laughs> you know, you. I told you I was going to take you in a different direction. You didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I wanted to mention it as a negative thing. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? This is not e-commerce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not e-commerce. I, that, that point was taken. And honestly, it's uh, <laughs> the adoption rate. No, wait, like where I struggle in my business, I own a, a print-on-demand business. It used to be yes, like a t-shirt business. Now it's a print-on-demand business. And we grew... T- the online awesome. business grew 6x. We're having an issue where the Gulf and other countries, we can't really sell to properly because, you know, you want to sell a T-shirt mm-hmm. to Dubai from here. If you're not in the Gulf as a warehouse, yeah. you have these barriers that, that are hardcore. This process of the Middle Eastern consumer just going in, click, click, yeah, click, yeah. click, click, done. It's not as seamless yet. Like you said, 2%, 3% penetration yeah. e-commerce in the Middle East. It's growing really fast. Yeah. And I don't know if these numbers that we're all hearing, is it the screenshot, WhatsApp, Dali al is that <laughs> okay. the numbers is we're, that being we're getting? Added up? That's probably it. Because honestly, where do you, maybe not. I don't know how, how they get their numbers, where they get these numbers from. Because I no, actually think it's underrepresented. I think this stuff can't possibly be counted. Probably not. Because it's not credit card. It's not, yeah, you know, it's not website. It's exactly. Not I, 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 exactly. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe we're way better than we think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a Middle Eastern version of you guys. Mm-hmm. All right. 
I'm even thinking if there isn't one to kind of go and talk to yeah. people who run small e-commerce mm -hmm. uh, and ask them, hey, guys, listen, do you want to join forces? Yeah. Maybe I have a great software, yeah. but you have a great warehousing system yeah. and this guy has a great delivery yeah. like, third party that we don't know about. And yeah. this guy, you know, yes. maybe we can join forces. So we're kind of looking for that, like, Shan Allah, give us yeah. some lifeline to kind of like, because we're not in, a, in sure, an open sure. market like like North America. Yeah. So we just need that little nudge and we're, we're home free. Yeah. If, uh, if we're looking for someone who's slightly on another level that yes. has these synergies. My yeah. initial question to you was going to be, would you guys ever think of creating a service department in yeah. Emerge that would just do onboarding yeah. of the synergies, not buy out? Yes. Have like an you know onboarding, see, sort onboarding. Of a, be like you know you don't want to buy services. So you know of, what you're not interested in buying me out. Yeah. Maybe I'm too messy. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't look good. Maybe I'm too tiny. But I'm really I would pay money yeah. to get plugged in to your system, I'll, and it'll I be see. a revenue stream for you guys. For I see. So is that something you're interested in doing? And the, yeah. the first part of my question was like, is there someone in the Middle East that actually is kind of like doing this kind of thing where they're swallowing up and enhancing e-commerce? It's actually very fascinating. I. I have yet to really think about our, let's call it synergies as a service model, which I'll credit you for if we ever nice. dabble into. Um, the trick is that there's a lot of cool things we can do. And that's the case for uh, many startups when they're on the rise. But I think time is your most valuable resource and focus is so key. So yes, in theory, could we build out, let's call it a synergies playbook and be able to tie that into other companies and get paid for it? Yeah, possibly. Um, and I think a bit that starts siding with the consulting world or the advisory world, which is cool, but isn't easily scalable. You know, we might put a team of 10 people that can service, you know, five startups, three startups, and then what? How do, you know, where would we go from there versus can we keep buying that next 10, $20 million business and take it to $100 million, like each, each one of those? So it becomes a, a focus and time constraint. I think the second point, though, is when we think of the Middle East, no, I don't know of anyone doing a consolidation play uh, in e-commerce or in, in tech. I think it makes sense if there are enough developed businesses out there to acquire that have already exhibited meaningful levels of uh, profitability and cash flow. I think the Middle East, from what I'm seeing, is about five to seven years behind the West, which is to say that I think in the coming years, you'll start seeing scrappier and scrappier startups. In fact, maybe some of them exist. I, we just don't know about them, by the way. I wouldn't be surprised. This is happening more often. Uh, where they are like running their own little lean ship and making you know, some profits. But I think the scale needs to come in a bit, right? And so I think that's a little tricky. Now, what I liked about what you said was maybe it doesn't have to be like hardcore acquisitions or M&A. Maybe it can be a partnership model or a JV model where everyone brings something to the table or an alliance of sorts. You know, there are some structures like that that the trick will be cultural because some people don't want to give up their companies unless, you know, they're paid a lot of money. I think at least culturally, like, you know, there's the sense that there's pride, they're building their business, they don't want to just you know, exited for some small amount. But I think if if someone took a lead and uh, and identified different strengths in startups and offered a, maybe a first step, a partnership or an alliance of sorts, where if things went well, then maybe there could be a bigger strategic discussion. But yeah, I mean, just like anywhere else in the world and in any other industry in the world, acquiring companies is not a new model. We didn't make it up. We just applied it to e-commerce. Exactly. And then you have the Shopify yes. uh, model, which is... Uh, not quite synergies as a service, yes. but it is a focus on the uh, platform side. Yes. And then even they opened up yes. uh, the door of the apps, the Shopify app store totally. for everybody to come in and just develop their own stuff. You know? We're very, very big fans of Shopify. Uh, as I say, they are a Canadian hero and poster child of modern technology and, and e-commerce. I think, though, for them, they're building this massive ecosystem and empowering everyone from the local t-shirt store all the way to some other major retailer, a multinational retailer. But they're really sort of equaling the level playing field for folks to come in and, and leverage their platform and not have to worry about technology, but rather worry about their business. 
We like it because it creates more bootstrap companies, which we can go and buy. Some people misunderstand, hey, are you like the next Shopify? No, uh, not because we're not going to 100 billion, but because they actually service e-commerce companies and we buy them, right? Exactly. So the more, the more of those that they create, the more we can go out and buy. But I think, you know, there's definitely strength in combining small to medium-sized businesses. That I can tell you. Now, you know our culture as well. Like, can you bring a lot of founders that aren't exactly the same from the same mindset and will they coexist? Uh, will they agree to stick around together? Will they be okay with a new CEO? Uh, that's a little trickier, right? And that's something that'll take a bit of finesse. Yeah, yeah, man, that's amazing. Um, so again, congratulations on last month's uh, IPO and on last night's uh, new acquisition. That's Thank incredible. you. Incredible, awesome, buddy. You're heading back soon to Toronto. Heading back soon. You know what? I enjoyed a bit of an extended stay here. There's a lockdown in in Toronto, and uh, so I ended up sticking around yeah. post New Year, which wasn't the plan. Um, we closed that acquisition on New Year's Eve. <laughs> and close this deal now. So just trying to enjoy. And obviously, this is part of my good times here. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and appreciate you hosting. I'm a fan of your show. Uh, good luck with everything. Truly believe in you. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Great Amazing. to see you, man. So the interview initially ended there. But off the record, we started talking about exhaustion and the toll all the work takes on you. And we decided that the health topic was too important not to cover. So we switched the mics back on, and here goes. It takes its toll. That's something yeah. I wanted to speak about that I forgot. Oof, the toll? Yeah. You wanna add it in? We should, maybe. You know what? Hey, let's, we can add let's it do in. it. I want to talk man. about mental. Yeah. Um, the mental health discussion has to pick up in this part of the world. It's something that's totally missing and lacking, and maybe taboo even. Um, but I've been very fortunate in Canada and, and in really North America and frankly the Western world uh, where this mental health and stress management discussion has taken center stage. Uh, there's actually a, a mental health day there. I, I don't know if it's a global thing anymore. But the amount of pressure that founders and entrepreneurs are under is unprecedented. And it is an incredibly, for all the all the glitz and glamour that people see when uh, we're posting and I'm posting things, you know, accomplishments and milestones and all that. Anyone who knows me and takes the time to know me knows that um, it's a very lonely uh, life and it's a very difficult uh, life, even when things are going well, even when things are going well. And it's incredibly difficult when people around you can't relate to what you're going through, why you're doing what you're doing, why you're dedicating the time for it. And I really think the danger becomes when you lose track, which is easy to happen. If you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, um, frankly, if, if you're down on yourself, you know, especially as a CEO, buck stops with you. Like if things go right or wrong, the trick is that you've got to recognize that everything good or bad that happens with your business has nothing to do with your own self-worth. And I think a lot of people tend to associate and forget that you are you no matter what. No one can change that. So your learnings, your growth, you have to put all of that into perspective. This is a degree in building companies. It's a degree in growing up as a person. And so if you keep that in mind, hopefully that gives you a bit of balance. But even then, I still struggle sometimes with the sheer amount of work and stress that I have on my plate. And it's caused a lot of tension. Uh, and I don't know if you could see, and you were asking me to come closer so that you could get the camera. I was moving further because I was, I was having tension in my head as we were speaking. I was up quite late yesterday with the transaction. And frankly, you know, you start hearing different stories and tragedies in the startup world that really can be avoided if we all took our mental health, uh, as well as physical health, um, more seriously and, and made it a priority. So I, I really wanted to come out here and tell everybody that's watching, especially people who are going through a tough time. Again, we don't speak a lot about it here, but we really should. And uh, uh, if you're busy, if you're doing things, if you're building things, it's a stressful life. You better manage it the right way. Are there any tweaks on your own habits that you've realized that you've really had to make to become more resilient to all the stress? Yeah, especially so this year. I mean, I, I spent about a half a day 
uh, here while in Jordan doing some tests and going, you know, everything from eyes to I have a bit of an inner ear thing lately. I'm, I'm dizzy. dizzy. Oh, my I'm, God. I'm dizzy. Vertigo? Something like yeah, vertigo? Yeah, well, they, they've, they've ruled out vertigo, but, you know, it's a bit of an inner ear situation. That's, Is it, does it cause tension in your head? It or causes just, or just tension dizziness? all over my head. Does it cause any nighttime vomiting? No, no? I, I have none of that. Thanks, right, Doc. good. Because no, uh, I had vertigo, you had vertigo for a few months, yeah. and it turned into something else. And it's gone now? And the ENT couldn't figure it out. I did a brain MRI two months ago. I did a brain MRI yesterday. Was it clear? Clear. But I have okay. a disc in my neck, <laughs> which yeah. which also ties back. Holy I got shit. my, I got, I went to check out my shit, eyes. Man. I have dry eyes, <laughs> right? And, and the doctor said, you can't imagine how many people are coming in during COVID. Too much screen time, bad posture. Um, other things, like I work with no interruptions now. Like I'm just on the screen with the wrong posture on my screen for hours and hours. And so... That plus the stress and plus the accumulation of work. I think I think I've done three years of work in a year. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. know, man. And so, so that's got to take its toll on you, right? And it has with me. And it's the one area where today I can't really say with a straight face. You know, here's my advice on managing stress because I'm still figuring it out. But I recognize that it could become a bigger issue and it needs real attention. Man, no, I agree. I hope you you find out what that is, and uh, man, yeah, take it easy. And I know you've you've been taking it easy here relatively. Sleep. I know you're. Yeah. yeah. The, the jet lag issue is. <laughs> yeah, it's a disaster. Uh, and uh, I think most of our audiences know that sleeping, waking up early, and getting that meditation, stretching, yeah. uh, downtime without screens in the morning is one of my personal favorite things to do, which I've been not able to do as much as I'd like. I don't know if that's part of your morning routine. Do you have a morning routine at all? Um, no, not to the extent that stretching is something I've been doing for the last few months. I haven't gotten myself to, I don't have the patience for yoga and meditation, although yeah. I hear it's game changing and it sounds like I'm the last man in. Uh, I want to try it. I want to get more serious about it. You have to have buy into it by by just having one one successful meditation, yeah. and I do it by the way for three minutes. I don't have yeah. the patience for it either. Yes, and I try to combine meditation and stretching. Yeah, just <laughs> in yeah. yeah, those yeah. three minutes. You're about to task Otherwise, it. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> but something, at yeah. least something. Totally. Um, the other thing I do, which is a joke right now, and my mom thinks you know I'm nuts, is I I actually listen to quite a bit of uh, classical m- uh, music and uh, and opera. <laughs> Nice. And so I do my little bubble baths now, huh. uh, and uh, <laughs> it sounds hilarious. You walk in this Pavarotti. Yeah. So, uh, it was opera. That's that's meditative. That's uh, almost meditation. It's kind of no, right? It's not. You're not listening yeah. to to anything to take your mind off. Yeah, yeah it's, just it's, it just feels a bit. It's not data. It's yeah. not news. Yeah. It's not uh, Netflix. Yeah, right? that's right. It's, that's meditation. So it must to me. be good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, and I, I don't like listening to opera, but uh, classical music maybe. Classical, yeah. yeah Give it. A shot. Tab Hada, we'll we'll uh, we'll send you off one more time, or we'll edit this part too. <laughs> pretend this is the only yeah. send off. Hassan, thanks for coming to Amman, and thanks for dropping in to yeah. Saudi Arabia. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. I'll visit you one day in yeah. Canada. Please. It's also, my brother moved there. There you go. Um, take care, buddy. Good luck yeah. and congrats. Habibi, thank you, Amman. Really appreciate you having me. This episode was brought to you by Mlebbas.com, your print-on-demand merch and gift provider that ships all over the world. 